In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer fitness, health questions from people who are listeners like you. What they do is they go to our Mind Pump Media Instagram page. They post a question underneath the Qua meme. That's Q-U-A. Les Qua. Yeah, don't ask. <laughs> and then we pick the best questions and we answer them. But at the beginning of the episode, we talk about uh, current events, our lives. We bring up interesting articles. Sometimes we mention our sponsors. Here's what we talked about in this entire episode. So we start out by talking about the commercials against CTE. This is the brain uh, trauma that people get from repeat. It's worth a watch. It's pretty shocking. Yeah, so they're trying to, trying to tell us that uh, kids playing football is like smoking cigarettes every single day. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Then we talked about Coca-Cola's new subscription model. That's going to be very interesting. Uh, we talked about how GNC is closing a lot of their stores. That's the, the popular supplement company. That brought me to talk about supplements and CLA, conjugated linoleic acid. This is a fatty acid that has been shown to burn body fat and build muscle when calories are equal. And you'll find higher concentrations of CLA in grass-fed meats versus grain-fed meats. So if you eat grass-fed beef, for example, more CLA in it than you'll find in grain-fed meats. Now, our favorite source of grass-fed meat is ButcherBox. This is a company that delivers grass-fed meats to your door. They also deliver heritage pork, uh, bacon that is uh, minimally processed. It's a great company to get your meat from. And again, it's delivered Dude, to it's your door. Dude, it's unlimited bacon uh, right now, isn't it? No, no, no. It's free. Oh, I lied. <laughs> no, right? So ButcherBox is one of our sponsors. If you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, this is what you will get. Free ground beef and bacon plus $20 off your first box. Go over there and check it out. Then we talked about Justin's Christmas dinner raffle. Uh, they were giving away some prizes. His kid said 666 at one of the raffles. The devil. <laughs> that sucks. Uh, which led me to mention uh, one of our other sponsors, NCI. This is a certification course uh, that focuses on nutrition. They have a huge giveaway. Okay, so this is for everybody listening right now. If you go to ncicertifications.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get a free thyroid masterclass certification. It's free. It's a $600 program for free. You can also enter to win an additional $500 gift certificate towards their level one and level two certification. So make sure you go to that website, sign up. It's unlimited. So go check it out. Then we talked about long rest periods for building muscle. I talked about a study on lifting to failure. We talked about brightness and sleep, how the brightness of your lights affects your sleep. And then we got into the fitness questions. The first question was, what is your favorite way to develop forearms? So we talked all about forearm exercises and lifts and ways to train your forearms so that they look better. The next question, this person wants to know what the optimal way to use trigger sessions is. Now, trigger sessions are unique to MAPS Anabolic. That's one of our workout programs. Trigger sessions can be added to any workout, though. So if you want to learn how to use them, make sure you listen to that part of the episode. The third question was, this person wants to know how to help people who have trouble with sugar. Sugar tends to be a trigger food for a lot of people. Uh, so we talk all about uh, you know, ways to avoid the binging that can occur sometimes when you restrict yourself, strategies. And then we also mentioned Magic Spoon cereal. Uh, it's, a, it's a cereal that's high protein, minimally processed. It's, one of our, it's like kid's cereal that's high in protein. It's crazy. It's awesome. Anyway, we have a hookup. Go to magicspoon.com forward slash mind pump and get yourself a discount. The final question was, is a plant-based diet superior to a meat-based diet? So we talked all about what best diet, uh, what diet is best for you. That's my English. I was talking like Yoda there for a second. <laughs> also, this month, MAPS Aesthetic is 50% off. Now, MAPS Aesthetic is our workout program designed for people who want to change the appearance of their body. They want to sculpt and shape their body like a sculptor or like a bodybuilder or bikini competitor. It's a very effective program. It is advanced, so make, so make sure if you sign up for it and do it that you have some training experience. Here's how you get the 50% off. Go to mapsblack.com and use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space, for that discount. Yeah, you just tell me when we're all ready to rock and roll. Did you get some of that, uh, Andrew, you get some of that Bailey's in your coffee? Rock and or? roll. Passed. You passed? Yeah. Oh, man. Pass what? He doesn't drink on the job. Yeah, what the hell's wrong with you? I know. I was letting. I was. Come on, dude. It's the holidays right now. <clears throat> what? Go a little easy on these guys. Yeah. Huh? 
See? What a bad example. That's why we couldn't tell him, bro. Huh? See? That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. I knew it was something. Okay. I heard All I heard from the back was, hey, he, when don't he, tell Sal. So I'm like, it, are you giving drugs to people again? In his 20s, they used to call him Santa Claus because he was the drug guy, dude. Now, <laughs> like, he's fucking the miser. He's the Grinch yeah. now. Yeah, he is he's the Grinch, Grinch, dude. No, no, Just no. Just no, fucking true. coal in everybody's stocking. If you try, listen, yeah. you follow Adam's lead, you might not make it. He's like Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> some reason who, by the way, he who by the way is going to live lines of ants who's going to live to be 110 or something. Some I reason, know. Yeah. Defies, Him and Keith Richards like right. they've taken all the drugs and they're going to live the other, forever. What's the other guy? Uh Ted Nugent. Nugent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I told you. Well, wait. he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't take drugs though. No. Oh, he's a Nugent's he's, is like straight he's edge. He's just crazy. He's crazy. Oh, he's wow, insane. Okay. I yeah. told you my theory on that, right? Huh. Well, why they're still alive? Yeah, because their body adapted to all that stuff just, and they're resilient. They killed all the weak cells. Yeah. They yeah. Were, <laughs> no. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They're yeah. like natural That's chemo. That's what it is. <laughs> so I, many drugs that I, I, I don't die I believe all. there's a little science to that. I think that's true, dude. I, I mean, our I, bodies are adaptations. It's like the Spartans. They used to <laughs> listen, kick, kick listen, all the weak our bodies, babies our off bodies the Our bodies are adaptation you know machines. I mean? Do we not agree on that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you were hammering it with all these drugs all the time, yeah. and you actually survive it, the body probably becomes very resilient to that. And then if you decide you don't, it's like- The strong cells survive. Yes. Wow, that sounds yeah, very scientific. You just, yeah, you filter actually, it out. Dude. Actually, no, what I think it is, this is what I think it is, I think that it's just they already are the kind of people that can survive those things. And so what you see is the leftover. Because yeah. I can tell you something right now, if Ozzy Osbourne did not live that way, he probably would still be alive, but he'd probably be able to talk. <laughs> yeah. You know, he can't really yeah. talk. <laughs> He can't really talk anymore. You know what I mean? He kind of moves funny or whatever. Dude, so I, was watching, I love Osby, by the I way. I was watching TV last night, and this was on YouTube TV, I believe, and I was just like completely shocked. And I wanted to kind of show you guys like this commercial spot that I saw and get your reaction, and then we can kind of discuss what they're what trying to do. What were you watching? Yeah, what's on the TV? Uh, yeah, that, I just I had Doug kind of loaded up because uh, this was a campaign from uh, basically CTE. So this, this this organization that's trying to address CTE, and it's like a flag Chronic, football. Chronic, traumatic, encephalopathy. 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 <laughs> this is, uh, let's see, the title says, Tackle Can Wait, Concussion Legacy Foundation. Right. I can already guess what this is going to show. Okay. Let's, let's see. Go ahead. Let's, let's just like, let it, it roll. Is this going to be like your commercials? Like this is your brain on drugs. And then yeah, I mean it, it has that shock value to it. I yeah. just thought it was interesting. Uh, you know their spin on it. Let's so. see. Let's see. I want to see what the Concussion Legacy Foundation. So there's a bunch of kids playing football, obviously right, right. Oh, tackling. Oh, Passing cigarettes out to <laughs> You see that? And the coach That's is like passing out cigarettes. Oh my God. The mom's lighting the it up for the kid. Oh my God. What a <laughs> hilarious commercial. Yeah. Kids who start tackle at 5 to 14 are 10 times more likely to get brain disease CTE. Let me smoke. When should oh. I start tackle? <laughs> That's it. That's the entire commercial. It's like. You know what's funny? That's brilliant. We, right? It's it, smart. It took, you know. Two two decades, I would say, uh, for the the word to get out on how bad cigarettes are, and now that like that's the consensus. Now everything is compared. It's the go to. Yeah. It's the, that's it's bad. like the, it's like Nazis. You yeah. know, it's like everybody's everything. Everything evil is compared and to Nazis. We're, we're guilty of doing it too. Sal yeah. just mentioned a study the other day that compared you know the the not poor healthy yeah. poor relationships with smoking cigarettes every single day. It's a but really dude. It was it, it's a different thing when you compare it to it, and then you watch little kids lighting up cigarettes and smoking. It's so absurd. I think that was pretty funny. Actually. You know, that's, that's funny. Just, that's yeah, a but... very smart commercial. Uh, they make a really good point, but the, but the problem with that is that, God, what do you do? Because here's what I see from this: what they're trying to say is don't don't have your kids play tackle football. Maybe don't have them box. Fine, but what parents are going to see from that is. Stay on the couch and don't do anything. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they they were trying to kind of steer more towards flag football, which I don't think they they conveyed a good enough job. Uh, you know, getting people to to instead of throwing pads on and and tackling too early, like having them do flag football, and then after 14, your mm -hmm. chances are reduced quite substantially for you know getting CTE. But oh, that's interesting. Which I can get behind that. I thought it was the other way around. So the the older you get, the less likely it is. I I would when you start later. It's if you start too early, it's like oh. the, the got, volume of it. You end up oh, and just with a the lot. Brain you know, a lot, is still developing. I got like I, I want to look this up. I yeah. want to look up the studies and compare them because sometimes they'll take results and they'll spin it a bit. Yeah, yeah. because okay, is it are they more likely because their brains are developing and they're 
tackling, or is it just because they've just been tackling for more time? Because I would. Because yeah. here's the saying? thing. Okay, maybe the brain is more vulnerable when they're younger, but the likelihood that they get hit by a hit that would really do any damage is correct. Got to be much lower. They're correct. Yeah, those than hits a, aren't very substantial. Yeah, Matt, a, high, a high school kid, a high school kid who's at that about that age is starting to be taught to go take the guy's also, head off. Also, I'll right? make I'll make this case right here that a younger brain uh, is far more plastic um, in the sense of its ability to adapt than an adult mm. brain. So, like, if you're a little kid and you bang your head real hard, the I would think that you'd have the ability to adapt. And, and versus an adult, where adults have, you know, injuries and then their their, their slurred speech or whatever. The rest yeah, of the I'd, I'd be curious to see that because most of what I've seen, you know, promoted is the fact that it's the the amount of time and the amount of actual like contact collisions. And so it's not even necessarily head trauma as it's, it's actual like physical collisions that, you know, cause your brain to, to slosh and hit, you know, the front. You know, what's un un unpopular about that is that soccer. Oh yeah. Yeah. Soccer. Lots of, uh, yeah. Lots of concussions and lots nobody of brings up soccer, but studies show that CTE soccer there, yeah, yeah. because of heading the ball. Yep. So right. they're trying to change it so that, Which, or even and, just bumping into other players. And at a young age, I would think that's that's far more likely a, a kid who's uh, you know nine, ten years old, you know, so, someone who kicks a ball hard and then you head it. I would think is far more risky or dangerous than the you know nine year old kids that are hitting each other with pads on. Like if you've yeah. ever watched you know Pop Warner football. Yeah. And you see two kids going at, at each like other, hug each other. Yeah, it's yeah, like a, uh, uh, yeah. It's I mean, <laughs> it's like they're wearing these padded sumo suits. Yeah, you know? and like, that's not to uh, say there hasn't been cases where something has potentially happened or that freak accident when it just time just right. And it's just I don't like scaremongering, uh, or as Adam would say, mongling. Mongling <laughs> <laughs> sounds better with an L. Yeah. Mongling. Yeah. I don't like scaremongering like this because they're trying to make a good point, but because they're doing it in a way that is. Uh, that, that's I believe to be ineffective. It's going to backfire, right? Because I could use the same. I could do the same thing and say, children who play sports between the ages of seven to fourteen are ten times more likely to go paralyzed. You know? Because why? Because you're moving yeah. and you might hurt yourself. No, so, I know it's, it's a tricky thing because you get what thirty seconds. Mm. How are you going to get somebody's attention? Well, you you're seconds? not you're not far from this being a serious decision for you, right? I mean, your boys are yes. getting your boys are getting to that age where Pop Warner football will be coming, right? Yeah, and that's why I've already started with flag football uh, because I do feel that they get a lot out of um, you know the gameplay of it, learning you know where yeah. everybody should be. Like you, you get a lot of that going into high school, which I think is is enough. You know, they don't need to tackle right now. Like that's mm. not something that's a skill they can develop later when they're is a little more formed, I think, but I mean, I'm not. Did I'm you not play Pop Warner? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't play until I was a freshman in high school. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. So Dude, now, if your boys want to play high school football, you're cool. I mean, yes, but at the same time, I'm still paying attention to the science and the research, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe the best techniques, or maybe we change the technique of them tackling. You know, I don't know. Well, that's already happening. I mean, you see exactly. that in the NFL. Like, I mean, we're it's getting, and, and a lot of people can't stand it that are that are fans and consumers on all the flags. And but I mean, they're obviously the NFL is trying to do something to counter this, right? I was just reading an article. Yeah. This was uh, actually a while ago that. There's this new helmet technology that they're researching. I guess there's this material that somebody developed that uh, reduces the impact uh, from a hit significantly. And the NFL is kind of investigating and seeing if this is something that they want to. Put I mean, in they out. always are. I mean, every couple of years uh, they do a whole clean out the old helmets. I mean, that was the big thing with Antonio Brown, yeah. right? Why Antonio Brown, uh, his whole ordeal was he wanted to play with his original helmet, which is like. Uh, seven-year-old technology or nine-year-old technology and they they were the nfl said no you can't yeah i've actually seen some cool things like with sensors in the helmet where they can monitor just like a hrv where they can monitor the amount of impact you've had you know throughout oh, the week cool. and so then they can sort of adjust that based off of practices so it's like let's do hitting drills let's back off hitting drills you know or whatever it is but um, yeah, dude. Again, there's there's risk in 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 each sport, and there's risks in in physical things that you're going to pursue, and so you just got to kind of weigh them out yeah. and see whether or not it's worth it. And meanwhile, in Russia, they have uh, <laughs> yeah. MMA with uh, swords and yeah. armor, <laughs> or just like like slap fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for no reason. Or, yeah. Have you guys seen? By the way, the uh, I've seen the slap ones, which is funny. They literally yeah. just stand there and they they just take it like just to, to knock the other talk guy about out. head trauma. But then there's a they actually have MMA fights where they're wearing full armor, 
yeah. shields and swords. <laughs> yeah, then did you Real see swords. Did you see that where they have platforms? So they have the, the, the shield swords and then they can jump up on a platform and then fight on top of a platform, jump off onto people. And- Dude, one I, I saw like, one what? fight where the guy gets he got hit with a sword on the side of his metal helmet, gets knocked down. The guy gets on top of him and just starts blasting him with a shield. <laughs> I was like, this is in Russia. Yeah, they're like, you pussies. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, yeah. over here, we're like, don't, yeah. Yeah, don't play football. I saw some crazy news. Did you guys see the article that I sent over about Coca Cola? No. Uh, did I? Oh, wait, it was a membership that Oh, I didn't Yes, I, didn't I sent like it over late last night. A subscription? Wait, yeah. they have yes. a subscription model? $10 a month for Coca Cola. Doug, you got to pull this up. Wait, how well, much what does that get? entail? Yeah, what is that? <clears throat> well, like? I'm assuming that it's. Uh, I, it didn't show, uh, or I couldn't find anywhere uh, exactly what you get with that. I'm sure we could look it up and figure it out. Yeah, that makes a big difference. Uh, well, uh, why? I mean, I, I, don't you think it's going to be unlimited? Uh, t- unlimited Coca-Cola for 10 bucks? <laughs> yeah. In Everybody am- gets diabetes. In America, they'd go yeah. bankrupt. You think so? You have re- yeah. you have free refills when you go to a McDonald's. Yeah, or but you don't fast- live at McDonald's. Mm. I don't. I cannot see. Let's see. Yeah, wow. let's look at the details here, Doug. Yeah, what does that even mean? Oh, maybe read that and let us know what that looks like or whatever. Let's see. The company. I mean, it's our, it, uh, stock price has already jumped. Uh, from because of this? Oh, yeah. I mean, they release some other flavors and some things like that that they attribute Exclusive to Exclusive access to all new flavors. But uh, tell, me, flavors. tell me how... I mean, no, it's going to be a good deal, right? You don't do $10 a subscription fee, and it's just like anything else. They, they've already probably figured the math okay, out on so what I the average consumer you know, oh, drinks. Oh, okay. So it's the Insider's Club, and then what they do is they send you, you new... a box? They send you new flavors and stuff every month. That's what it is. Uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. So I'm scanning the article. It looks like they, they you, get a, you get a box, and every month... How they much? You, though, how much is in the box? Though that's what I'm. What I'm. I, I, I guarantee it's. You're gonna win, right? It's gonna be. A, I don't think it's as much of a value of a, a volume thing. It seems like this is more of a value of like a you get to try new cool flavors every month. Uh, I bet like it's. I bet it's club. both. You hmm. think so? I bet it's both. Of course. I mean, they're not losing. Okay, if uh, see the first one hundred. Oh, there you go. <laughs> see the first one thousand insiders. We'll get an exclusive first taste of some 20-plus new beverages. That's what it is. No, that's just the first 1,000 people to sign up for. That's the incentive to, yeah, get, that's, you in the yeah, to get you going right subscription. away. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, what is the actual subscription? I think that's what we're trying to dig at. Yeah, if they did Unlimited, bro, they'd go bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I know people, dude. I've trained people. I'm sure you guys have too. Oh, I've man. trained people. My brother back in the day that drink. They wake up in the morning, Coke. Yeah. Another one for lunch. Another one on their break. Well, we can, dude, for- do you remember well, we double can- gulps at, at 7-Eleven? Yeah. Like my brother used to take those down, like on our way to church. It's like a liter just- of. There it is, right there, Doug. What does it say? Shoppers have the option to pay for the limited edition boxes for ten dollars per month, or prepay for all six months and save ten dollars for a total of fifty dollars up front. Yeah, so you just go. limited edition, limited edition boxes. Yeah, no way they're gonna do. <laughs> I'm telling you, that would go bankrupt. The way people drink soda, <laughs> I know, in this country, it's, people start taking yeah. baths in it and shit. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, <laughs> can you imagine? There has to be there has to be some research Watch on car. <laughs> on what the of all like Coca Cola consumers Coca-Cola. where the the threshold is. There's always gonna be outliers, right? There's sure. always gonna be somebody like you said that literally would yeah. bathe in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're they're <laughs> baptized. Kyle. But but I would actually I, I would actually think that there is a a, a larger majority that. You know, drinks Coca Cola, you know, once a day or whatever. Yeah. And if you do the math on, okay, we just got to figure out where that sweet spot is. Yeah, we're going to lose money on Timmy who bathes in Coca Cola, yeah. but <laughs> we're going to we're going to make a ton of money on all the other assholes people. coming into a building holding like two liters, just <laughs> shaking them up. Yeah, I'm fucking balling. <laughs> don't worry, I pay the subscription. Yeah, yeah. it's unlimited. Yeah, don't use the water to wash the car. What are you talking about? <laughs> Use the Coke. Well, I wonder how much. So the how many can or how many cans or how many liters are in a in, in the box? Does it say, Doug? It's it's probably just exclusivity. Like here's your. Yeah. So here's the details on this. So starting in January, insiders, which are these people who subscribe, I guess, will receive monthly shipments of beverages, which can include anything from AHA flavored sparkling water to Coke Energy for six months. They'll also include other surprises, although the company didn't specify what those might be. Mm, surprises. Mm, surprise. Like, Our old formula with yeah, Coke. The fifth, the fifth <laughs> There's month. There's a Pepsi yes. in there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fifth month comes with insulin. <laughs> oh, it's month five. It's about time for your, 
your insulin. You know, I, what else I was reading last night is uh, uh, GNC is projected to close 900 stores. Oh, the supplement company? Yes. Yeah. It's about time. Yeah. Well, it was only a matter of time, right? Yeah. Imagine all the people. Remember at 1.2, I talked about put, potentially uh, working with a, uh, a, sh a supplement shop, right? A shop that actually was in, in location over off the Brunel, uh, over by the Golds over there. Uh, a buddy of mine actually bought it from somebody Max else. Max Muscle? No, yeah, no, it's not Max Muscle. Okay. It's, Nutra. Sport. Nutra Sport. And, it's not, and it's bought again by somebody else. It's, Nutra uh, Shop. I can't right? think yeah. of his name right now. Uh, Oh, Supplement well. stores are, are not a good investment. No, not now. No, not now. I mean, they were, be. yeah, they were a, a cash cow. One. They were a cash cow at one point. Especially for the location, if it was right next to a gym, that's yeah. like prime. I, I almost bought one when I uh, when I went, uh, before I opened up my personal training studio, what I wanted to do was open up a supplement store. But what stopped me was I was buying my supplements on bodybuilding.com at the time. And I would see that online you could get way better prices and way more variety. Yeah. And I and then Amazon started blowing. I thought this is no way people are going to buy yeah. supplements at the supplement store. There's it's no all, way. Yeah, Dude, it's all almost. retail is suffering. And the margins are shit. They're not good. Supplement market's gotten so competitive that unless you come out with a new product that nobody has, like pre workout supplements used to have great margins when that market first came out. Now yeah. the margins are bad. Protein powder is the worst m margins of all. Oh, Terrible. Yeah. When they first came out, when Designer Way, it was Designer Way that really popularized whey protein. Yeah. When that came out, it was tw it was like the, you know, the tube. It's like a uh, looks like a, a cardboard tube, like yeah. the smaller mm -hmm. serving. What is that? Twelve ounce or whatever. That was almost fifty bucks back in uh, I want to wow. say nineteen ninety eight. I would say I would buy that for like forty eight bucks whey protein. That's when I was packaging it. Because nobody had. So I worked in I worked in a mixing factory. So you're trying to say that I probably had some some protein that you <laughs> absolutely <laughs> you, for sure. And I and there? I mix scooped all the time on accident. You know what I'm saying? Mixed, you yeah, you just, there was there was there. no regulation. That's what I, I mean. That was like really my first introduction to like how did you just like have a little bit for yourself? Like little oh, for dude, you, little was, for me. Oh yeah, the kids. Come on, the kids. We always oh missing bag or barrel. Whatever. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, come on. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're massive factory. There's probably. 30 of us on an assembly line. And I mean, that was one of, uh, God, what a, what a crazy job. I remember working in the hopper. So we were, you would be up, you would get these. Get to the hopper. Yeah, the, hopper. the hopper. You'd have these <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. like three ton bags that they would take a crane and it was just full of uh, the, the mixing powder. And there would be two of them and they they'd run down this funnel. And my job, if I was running the hopper that day, everybody would rotate, right? Like you wanted the hopper job because you you could you, you're upstairs by yourself in this closed room with this big giant bag of protein, and you would uh, <laughs> you would fall asleep on the bags, and you wouldn't wake up until you hear this goo 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 hopper. People yell at you because because it got caught, you know, it got stuck a little bit. But for the most part, if you get it going right. It'll just feed down to the assembly just line. Fall asleep. Oh yeah. So and it was one of those jobs. I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to be there, and and you would. We'd all like you know Rochambeau for who gets to be the uh the in the hopper because you knew that you could go to sleep for a couple hours, you know. And every once in a while, someone would bang on the thing, and then you wake up, and then oh, you get up, you jump up, and you shake the bag a little bit, get it going again. Dude, they used to throw away uh, away uh, way away. They used to yeah, throw it away. away. That was no considered way. the like the, the 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 waste or whatever. Yeah. And then they figured out that whey protein is a great it mixes easily. Of course, it's a, it's a good source of protein. So the first ones to really market that made out like bandits because it's cheap. Yeah. Whey is is cheap to buy, uh, but then it's then you could sell it expensively as a, a protein powder. Now the margin now are garbage. Now whey protein is. You're not going to make shit off of whey protein. Well, I, I, so many don't you think that's where uh, why the whole collagen thing got really big too? Was because it was that was another waste that people were kind of collagen was garbage. Yeah, when I when when, when you know when I was working out, Just needed a rebrand. Oh yeah, it was it, that's exactly in fact, what happened. In fact, yeah. they got called out uh, back then. Uh, I do you remember the American Bodybuilding? I'm sure they still saw ABBS. Them. Yeah, the drinks yeah, that yeah. would be behind the counter at the gym. I mean, that's what Speed Stack. Was oh, from. Speed Stack. Yes. Yeah. So so when I was a kid, I thought those were magic. I was like, terrible. Memories. I was like, oh fuck, it, that's all I got to do is drink those. Goes and I'm gonna fucking blow up. So I'm 16 years old. I start working out at the 24 Hour Fitness, and I'm, they have the th the counter. I had a job. I was you remember the thick job. recovery ones, bro? Ooh. What do you mean? Do I remember? <laughs> what do you mean? I would start. I would start my workout with Blue Thunder. That was the name of it. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Do you remember Blue Thunder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know why I like Blue Thunder? Because I, I would ask the girl behind the, the desk. Blue raspberry taste. No, or? I'd say, can you? They all garbage. I don't care what the flavor was. Terrible. <laughs> I'd say, let me see. Syrup. I'd say, let me see the box. You know, remember, this is I'm still me, so I'm 16 year old me, right? So yeah. I'm like, let me look at the ingredients. Like I knew what I was looking at. <laughs> I'd look at the bottle, and it just had the most stuff. 
I was yeah. like, whoa, this has everything. <laughs> <laughs> they just threw it all in there. I was like, this is the best. That's the best. So I do Blue Thunder before my workout, and then after my workout, I did, uh, I think it was Amino 3550 yes, or something like yes. that. <laughs> and all it was was collagen protein in whatever mix or whatever, artificially yeah. sweetened. And it would, all the know, leftovers. Oh, it was terrible. One time, <laughs> one time my cousin and I worked out hella hard because that's what we thought we were supposed to do. We spent, I think it was like two and a half hours at the gym. We drank... Uh, my, that might have been the first time I had a speed stack. So we went, we worked out for two and a half hours, pounded one of those, went back to his house, and he threw up because it was, because of all the drinks that we had. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Oh, so great. Anyway, speak, awful. Speaking of supplements, so you guys are familiar with uh, CLA, mm-hmm. yeah. conjugated linoleic acid. Yeah. You, were we selling those back at, in twenty four hours? Yeah. You guys yeah. were too, right? Yeah, it was part of the sta- there was a, uh, a yeah, I a, didn't a remember that. anabolic stack from uh, Evogen or er- yes. Ergogen, not mm-hmm. Evogen. That's the brand now. Yeah, yeah. Ergogen. That we used to sell and CLA, uh, methoxybolic, uh, DHEA, oh my God, that's right. uh, creatine. Uh, God, can I remember all of them? I know there was it was seven. I used to <laughs> and I used to, and it wow. used to retail for like three hundred eighty dollars, and I put everybody on it. Oh. Too. It was so bad. <laughs> so bad. 15 year old calcium or something. So bad. I mean, I was taking it too, I believed. You know what I'm saying? Dude, like, I gave so myself I, 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 I was just my... a dirty fucking salesman. Like, I was taking it all myself too. Oh, oh, oh we you were, believed the dream. We were drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But anyway, so CLA is a type of fat that when people, they've shown in animal studies, when animals consume it uh, versus other types of fat, they get leaner and they build more muscle. Human studies show uh, a, a similar, a less uh, dramatic but similar effect. So when people eat more conjugated linoleic acid um, and all calories are, are equal, so you get two groups of people both eating the same calories, both exercising, this group eats more CLA, this other group eats more other types of fats, the CLA group tends to uh, be leaner and have more muscle. So supplement companies jump on board, right? They start selling CLA uh, products, CLA, CLA capsules. The problem with that is that CLA, it's not all the same. Um, CLA, there's different types of CLA, and some types of it can cause more inflammatory type issues in people. So they were doing studies where they were people were supplementing with CLA capsules, and they found that, that doing so uh, increased liver enzymes and uh, inflammation of the body. But when people eat foods that are high in CLA, natural forms of CLA, that they actually, that doesn't happen, and they get the the health effects. I looked it up. Um, the CLA that's found in meat and dairy, so healthy in particular grass-fed meat. Grass-fed meat has way more CLA than grain-fed meat does. Um, 75 to 90 percent of it consists of the forms of CLA that are good for you. The CLA that's found in supplements, uh, as much as 50 percent, are coming from the forms that are inflammatory. Oh, so wow. it just goes to show you. It's now, not all is this all part of the same conversation when we talk about how it changes the fatty acid profile and how there's more? Yes. There's more. There's more. There's of, also more omega three fatty acids in uh, in uh, grain. Uh, excuse me, grass fed meat. So grass fed meat. When people say there's no difference, mm. uh, I, you know there is a difference. It's not huge. Like if you're just eating one steak, fine. But if you eat red meat on a regular basis, weekly. Or like I eat it four or, or five days a week. Or you eat a lot of high point. inflammatory foods already and then you're piling that on top right. of it. That's not a, that's not ideal. Right. Then you want grass-fed uh, red meat because it's way higher in the good form of CLA. It's higher in omega-3 fatty acids. It's just a healthier piece of meat, and so it does make a difference. Speaking of that, you just reminded me. Uh, so my last uh, Q&A I did on Instagram, uh, somebody uh, messaged or asked a question about Butcher Box and said that he heard that they are grass-fed, grain-finished. And I said, I've never heard that. And then I, I tagged uh, Butcher Box and asked, you know, could you guys address that? And they actually have a whole uh, they have a whole section on their website. And they, he sent the, the link over to me and said, absolutely not. You know, if uh, part of it saying that they are, uh, they are free-range, grass-fed, uh, their entire life. There's no grain whatsoever ever fed to any of those cows. So. Yeah, great. Excellent. G- grass fed, grain finished is almost the same as grain as grain fed their whole life. So what they'll do is they'll feed them grass, and then for the last part of their life, they'll feed them grain so that they the meat taste. Fatten them up a bit. Yeah, the end, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Butcher Box is 100 yeah. percent grass fed all the way, all the way through. And you know, look, here's the deal: you can taste. They're also the they're also too like if you're somebody who believes that it changes the way you treat them, like they're free range. They also get shelter. They get, sh- they get, they get treated shel- way better. They get shelter in, in bad weather, like so. They, I mean, the, the it's better for the environment right. because of the way that the animals uh, feed and fertilize the ground. 
they produce less waste. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a better. It's it's a it's a better if you're gonna eat meat, it's the best way uh, to do it um, by yeah. far. Absolutely. Did um, I tell you guys uh, about uh, I, I, the other day? We, we have this like community sort of dinner that we do for every Christmas and every holiday. Like all the homeowners kind of come together, and I, I sent a picture. And it was like all like silver hair out there. Oh, you like, did. I was the young, we were like the youngest uh, family that were there. And is this the neighborhood? Yeah, it's a neighborhood. So the whole neighborhood comes and um, and they provide us with dinner. It's really a nice thing, uh, but it's kind of a funny thing because like my mom gets really into this. Where uh, she's, I've told you guys before, she's really into costumes and used to make me wear like, for instance, uh, for St. Patrick's Day, I was the only kid that's ever been a leprechaun at school, no. <laughs> and like I thought that was normal. They did. Yeah, you went to school. Your mom dressed up as a leprechaun. No one yeah, else, dude. No one else dressed. <laughs> Nobody else was like, <laughs> nobody else told me, you know, what like grade? I just what showed up and I'm what, like, hey, nobody's else. What grade else. were you in? I was in probably Seventh. third grade. Dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah, third grade. In high and, school. <laughs> and uh, the, it was funny because like all these other like teachers were trying to, what? yeah, dude, they were, of no, course. they loved it. Like oh, the other <laughs> teachers were pulling me in their class and like I did this little Irish jig and I thought, yeah, you did. yes, oh, yes, my dude, God. it was so embarrassing. But anyway, I get to relive that now because like my two kids like have to deal with her craziness. <laughs> Right? Did she make them dress up? Yeah, so they had to dress up as elves, you know, going to this thing, and they hated it, you know? I'm like, you have to do it. I did it. Like, I'm, <laughs> so I'm, like, watching them squirm, like, you know, handing out raffle tickets and all this stuff to oh people coming God, in. Oh, my God, dude. And so, like, me and Courtney are dying, you know, because they're just, like, begrudgingly, you know, up there. But then they start getting into it and liking it, and she's dressed up as, like, you know, uh, uh, Mrs. Claus or whatever. Your but, mom? Yes. No way. Yeah, so the, there was another funny moment. So we get through with dinner, and we do the raffle and we're, we're he's like they're calling out numbers and so there's uh you know my two boys are like calling back and forth like which numbers and and ethan like he calls out six 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 and then everybody starts laughing and everything this is like a like a christian community oh, like yeah. thing or whatever yeah. and like he's it's uh like he, he had no idea what that meant and he, like later on he's asking me he's just like dad what what's so what is that you know and i'm just like uh, that's the sign of the beast. It's uh, the <laughs> devil, you know, it's the dark one. You know? <laughs> Apparently, they haven't covered that yet in Sunday schools. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to educate yeah. them on that. You're giving them like uh, uh, some some heavy metal. Yeah. Here, listen to so, this. So you gave it to an evil, you know, no. That's but, hilarious. Yeah. Well, speaking of, of giveaways, dude, uh, Jason Phillips and his NCI certification. Oh, did you see what they're doing? What's he hooking up this month? I know Here's, he's hooking up something else this Doug time. wrote it down. Doug, if you could scroll for me so I can read, uh, because he's given. Okay, here you go. Check this out. So it's the thyroid master class. Uh, it's a thyroid master class. So that's valued at $600. So that's being given away. He's giving that away to people who listen to Mind Pump yeah. for free. Yeah, I know. It's okay. dope. Wow. And, and on top of that, he's going to be choosing 10 winners to get a $500 uh, gift card to apply to either their level one or level two hormone or mindset course. And then they notify people via text. He's going all in with these giveaways with people, and I, I think love it, man. It's worked out well because we did the other one. What was it? The gut health one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gut health. Yeah. Huge response. Yeah, I think you had thousands, like thousands of people that yeah. popped in there to get that. I like it. I like that he's doing it that no, way. No, and I, I'm getting tagged and people DMing me afterwards about how awesome that is. So it's, what's cool is that, I mean, that would cost somebody 600 bucks to do that. And just by being a Mind Pump listener, you're getting access to that for free. Like well, if you're a trainer and you're listening mm -hmm. and you're not taking care or taking advantage of free education like this, especially, and I really, what I really like about Jason's courses is, uh, you know, because he's been a longtime trainer. He's 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 like where we come from, where you know, not to you know, I know we harp on academia sometimes, but one of the harps on academia is that it's it is it's just the, the purely science based information with not a lot of application behind it. It's like yeah, here's the science. Like, how do I do this? Right. It's like okay, great. I understand the science now, but what do I do when someone asks me this, or what, how do I handle that, or what are the st first steps I should take when I run into this scenario? And a, a lot of the stuff that he talks about is real world application and how to take that science and information and then how do you deal with it with a real client. And so anybody that I've met or talked to uh, on, on Instagram or Facebook or whatever that is, a trainer, and you're not taking advantage of this partnership that we have uh, with NCI right now, I, I just... Uh, well, thyroid is something interesting, very interesting to learn about. There's, there seems to be a rise in people with uh, thyroid autoimmune uh, type issues. Um, is it and, considered an autoimmune? 
uh, when you have uh, like Hashimoto's or antibodies, uh, yes. Okay, so is, some some of them are considered autoimmune, and some of them often often. So if you're if you have normal thyroid, and then you get older, and all of a sudden your thyroid isn't working well, or you have thyroid hormone, but you have symptoms of low thyroid, it could be that your body's developed autoimmunity. Um, and there's different ways to test for that. I'm not a doctor, so this is something you want to go see your doctor about. But you, as a trainer, I think it might be important to be able to identify potential symptoms and know where to direct people. You know what I'm saying? And it's, I mean, when I think back to, and this is just, if it's on the rise, I mean, I think just two decades ago when I was training clients, it was, you know, this is common. Mm -hmm. uh, thyroid conditions was uh, really common. In fact, I remember that uh, being hit with that as a trainer early on and being like, fuck, what do I do here? That was the most know, common thing to be medicated. All the time. Yeah. yeah. Most common thing to be medicated for. But it's important as a trainer to identify symptoms and then point you're not the doctor, right? You're not the one that's going to diagnose and you shouldn't, but it's good to know these things so that you could say, Hey, you know what? Let, you might want to get this checked out. Yeah. Let's go get yeah. this checked out and see what your doctor says. Yeah, and then now how is he is now, isn't he collecting phone numbers in order to do that? Like how does that, I know he was doing something different. If you, to yeah, announce if, you leave your, if you leave your phone number, you'll get taxed and that's the only way you can get the, the potential $500 gift card. And that's on our link. That's on the link that we're, yeah, what we'll, we said in the beginning of the episode with okay. the intro. So okay. anyway, uh, uh, cool study. Uh, cool study, but also not cool study. So I'll, I'll tell you guys why. I think you guys know why. <laughs> You're going to like studies, it. You hate yeah, it. studies showed they compared rest periods and compared rest periods for which one built the oh, most God, muscle. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> here we go. The study showed, what do you guys think? What what, what rest period built seconds. the most yeah. muscle? 90 it, seconds. It was the, it was a two minute. Okay. So two, two minutes. Yeah, close. So you guys are close. Two minute rest periods, two to three minute rest periods built the most muscle in comparison head to head, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually very true. But here's why I don't like that because that's true, but it's not always true. And it's not true forever. It's not true after six months. Yeah. That's a, it's a real easy, generic way to say that. Like it's yeah. not true after six months. Mm -hmm. If you follow that for six months consistently and you don't move out of that rest period, then it no longer becomes the best. And in fact, almost anything else now becomes better. You could go to shorter rest periods and I would be willing to bet you will not, I know you will be, you will build more muscle. You go to longer rest periods and increase your weight and intensity and you'll also build muscle. It's, it's like we say, talk about all the time with everything else. It's, yep. The body doesn't take, and it only uh, see studies like this used to used to confuse me because mm -hmm. as an early trainer, early fitness fanatic, I would read a study that said something me too, like this. Me too. And I'd be like, "Oh, that's the rest. I'm going to rest yeah. two minutes." This is what everybody's doing now. Yes, and I remember the first time, the first time I messed with rest periods because I would always do long rest periods because that's what I read. The studies even back then showed this. By the way, this isn't like new information. It's just a new study. And I remember the first time I read about supersets and the pump, and I said, you know, let me give this a shot and see what happens. And I built muscle. I was like, what the hell? I thought it was, you know, I thought I had to rest long, long time. No, it's uh, the the novelty makes a big difference. Now, if you if you measure head to head and you do a short study for three months or whatever, of course, eight to twelve reps, you know, long rest periods build the most muscle. But if you plan on working out for longer than a few months. Uh, you better start messing around with different rest periods because well, you, you know why this is so hard to counter too is because there there somebody reads something like that or gets told from a trainer or find learns and then they start to apply it themselves they like you see incredible results mm -hmm. and so try telling somebody you know it's just like have, how many times have you tried to tell a client that it doesn't matter to them they're like yeah. I already seen the results I, it doesn't matter what you're gonna try and tell me I should do. I know that when I started resting this this rest period or I started lifting this many reps or training this way, right. I saw the best results I've ever seen. And it's really hard to get them to look beyond that and go like, yeah, well, that's because you weren't doing X, Y, and Z. Now, it's like the nutrition thing, too. I talked to, I just did an interview of talking about this where, you know, we get so... Uh, we get so caught up in the, these camps and, and and diets and philosophies and ideologies of, of training and go, you know, we switch over to them, whether it be vegan, carnivore, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, right? And you switch over to it and you see these phenomenal results and we stay there and we, we attribute it to the diet or we attribute it to the rest period or we attribute it to the CrossFit or the Orange Theory or the new training regimen that I'm following right now. And it's it's none of that. It's mm -hmm. not it itself. It's what you weren't doing before, what you're doing now. That's what's giving you all the great results. And when you understand physiology, 
those will be sooner or later begin to diminish, and it's important that you move move out and around. Totally, totally. Uh, along those lines, another study came out about training to failure, and they compared groups of men. One group went to muscular failure. The other group stopped before muscular fa failure. And again, another study shows that not trained to failure produces better long-term results. People just build more muscle long term when they're not going to that extreme level of intensity all the time. But again, with this study, failure training probably has a place just intermittently, um, especially if it's novel. If you never train to failure, a few sets here and there to failure will probably give you some Now, when you're, when you're reading these studies, are you also uh, diving into the, what the group looks like, how big the group was, how many weeks or months they're actually following it? Are you? Are yeah, you I look at all that. I do. And most of these studies on, on fitness, here's the thing with fitness studies. They're pretty biased. They tend to be done on college-aged men. Uh, they tend to be done on untrained college-aged men. Uh, and their studies are typically smaller groups and for relatively shorter periods. And and th the reason for this is it's hard to get other people to be in studies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's usually college aged men who want to make a little money being in study, so they'll sign up for something like that. Um, so you're totally right. Now, you know that's what I love about those Russian studies. Which you one? Know, the, they go off on like the elite athletes that, and they oh. they follow them for years, mm. <laughs> and then uh, show their progress. And it was it, it, they definitely like concluded that same fact that like the you know intermittently maybe they 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 reach that that max effort, but <clears throat> you know the less frequently that they tap that, the better. Yeah, the the the, uh, the communist studies where they. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They force people to follow their yeah. thing. Where they kidnap people's yeah, kids. I and mean, they think about how much more effective that is than uh, voluntary. Trust right? me, we controlled everything. <laughs> <laughs> they were locked in the yeah, cage. Yeah, you're not going to refute that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. Crazy. Hey, anyway, uh, one last thing. I thought this was fascinating. Read some studies on uh, light and how it affects our sleep. And we've talked about things like blue light and green light and all that stuff. At the end of the day, this is important to, to communicate. At the end of the day, it's the most impactful thing on your sleep is the brightness of your light. So even though you may be mm. blocking blue light or doing certain things, if you're in a room that's bright and the TV is bright, the brightness of the light is sending the loudest signal to your brain. So at the end of the day, it's important that, sure, you wear your blue blockers, all that stuff. I still think people should dim or turn the lights off. Use Himalayan salt lamps uh, like I've been doing. Um, that will make the biggest difference. Why does this seem like, duh? Like, totally it's right. Super obvious. Just be dark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like turn the just turn lights everything. down a bit. You but know? even if you're you have a bright TV on and like let's say a, a blacked out room and you have your blue blockers on, you're you're definitely filtering a, a lot of that you, high blue light. You are, but it's still bright, right? It's still a bright light. So one thing you can do, and this is something that uh, I've started doing, is I obviously dim the lights. Um, we use Himalayan salt lamps. And if we watch TV, I dim the light on the, the backlight on the TV, which you can do. You can actually take your TV and make it less bright. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people that might affect their movie experience, totally get that. Um, uh, but if you're going to do this on a regular basis, it's probably a good idea to, to dim that. Well, you can set your phone like that too. I set my phone like that. As soon as it hits seven o'clock, my phone switches over to like the really, mm -hmm. like almost hard to see. It does it. Yeah, yeah. You mm -hmm. can change the, uh, and you can also switch the back uh, background of white. So right now everybody has like a like when you oh, tag to black. to black. So I switch mine goes to black, and then the the brightness of the screen actually mm -hmm. goes all the way down to the lowest after seven. But it's crazy what darkness does. I mean, go in a room that's pitch black, sit in there for thirty minutes to forty minutes, and try not to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. it, it works on everybody. Yeah. You know? No, I, I even noticed like, so uh, we've been kind of doing this lately. It's winter time. It's my favorite time to have like fires, obviously. So we all go downstairs. Our bottom floors with the fireplaces, there's no TV. There's, we don't have any really, we have one lamp that we normally have off in that room. So it stays relatively mm -hmm. dark. And uh, man, I, I, I just going down and sitting and like looking at the fire, like and talking to Katrina for like 30 mm -hmm. minutes to an hour before bed, boy, I can, it settles me way down. Night and day difference than that, than watching our favorite show and then going straight to bed. And yep. to your point, even wearing blue blockers, 
yes, it's better than not when I'm doing that. Yeah. But I, it doing something like that, you know, more organic, I guess you would say, that sitting down and just looking at a fire in, in the dark with her. Yeah, still I, had to, I had to regulate with, uh, you know, my oldest. He would read all the time. Like even when we, you know, I'd take him and put him down to sleep. He would, you know, turn his little lamp on and kept reading. But then he would wake up, you know, in the middle of the night, kept coming upstairs. And I'm like, what? what's going on? And, and then I found out later, like he kept reading with his light and that was interrupting you know his whole his whole cadence of like going to bed and like going falling asleep easier and so you started cutting that out and then like of course just like magic like he's sleeping through the night mm -hmm. yeah. could be worse could be doing drugs or something like yeah that. So i know kind of cool that your kid fucking it's true gets sneaks up in the middle of the night he's, and young, reads. Geez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like read all the harry potters now so <laughs> first question is from carrie jordan s what is your favorite way to develop forearms? This video you did on uh, our YouTube channel. The, the one everybody made fun of me about? Yes. I, <laughs> I, I will be the first to admit I did not foresee uh, the traction that that video would get. I remember you brought it up one time. Yeah, I thought that was a joke. Forearm training? Like, yeah. 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 And I anyway. was like, really, dude? He's like, no, a lot of people ask that. I'm like, all right, whatever, dude. And it's one of the most viral videos that we have and it's interesting i didn't think that was such a pain point for a lot of people i think two com i think there's a combination of things one it is a pain point for people who have skinny forearms um and think about it it's not popularized but the reality is if you're wearing a short sleeve shirt what's showing is your forearms and if they're muscular you can tell and it does kind of command a little bit of presence it's something that in fact when, uh, when women are pulled, body parts that they like most in men, hands and forearms, when it's given as an option, tends to be one of the top things. Are these like baby boomer ladies, though? You know, no, like from Popeye? Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the only time I knew yeah. forearms were popular. No, no, this is, this is, I think this is a, an evolutionary thing. I, I mean, can't confirm that. I only know, I've seen arms in general put in there, but I've never seen well, forearms uh, ranked Ask a out. woman, a man who rolls I mean, up, I'm not going to argue that much with you because you already won this argument. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. thing went fucking viral. There's yeah. the, there's your there's your litmus test but the right other, there. The other thing that I think is combination is there's not a lot out there. Could be, it's There's not a lot of information out there on how to train your forearms unless right. you're like an arm wrestler or you're you know, a rock climber. Nobody thinks about it, but uh, it's something that a lot of people ask. And this is funny because this is literally the fifth question on the meme of forearms. As we were scrolling through picking questions, there was five of people asking for them. So people well, want to know. Yeah, you know, and to your point too, I, I it's it's dual, right? There's the the aesthetic side that people probably want to have nice looking forearms, but it's also probably one of the number one limiting factors for people that are trying to strength train. Like mm -hmm. when you are trying to work on your deadlift, I mean, it's my limiting factor right now. Like I'm, I've been uh, trying not to use my straps and trying to do a double overhand right now, and I'm frustrated. It's frustrating for me because. It's not my it's not my legs, glutes, hamstrings, and back that are giving out. It's my forearms. Yep. I can I can definitely uh, pull the weight up no problem. Getting it off with my my back strength, I have a hard time with holding my holding the weight. I got really into forearm training uh, when I stopped using wrist straps, and I, I realized just how weak my grip was in comparison to my back. So I started to read. Uh, I found books and magazines for arm rest arm wrestlers are huge into forearm training. They're, of all the athletes that are out there, um, besides maybe rock climbers, uh, arm wrestlers probably have the best, I would say, forearm training. And then when I did jiu-jitsu and judo, I also found that it was real important because there was so much grip involved yeah, grabbing yeah, the with the gi. And whatnot. So here you can break down forearm training into a few different categories. One is the static type of training, the isometric holds. Now, isometric training, I think, is important for the whole body. But it's especially important for your forearms because much of the work that you're going to be doing with your forearms involves holding something. Mm -hmm. So more than any other body part that I can think of, forearm, your forearms and your grip require static strength because you're holding on. And it's not that you're, you're, you're not opening and closing your grip as much as you are just hold, closing your grip and then holding. So static training, in my opinion, should play a major role in your forearm training. So what what are some things you could do for for static? Well, you a forearm walk is phenomenal. Uh, excuse me, a farmer walk is phenomenal. Hold two heavy dumbbells or a trap bar, walk for distance, keep a tight yeah. grip. Don't go to failure. Bottoms up kettlebell press uh, or but not even press but just a hold and a walk with that is is very very good in, uh, for training the forearm. Yes, well. and static. It's all static. Static wise. Yes, and don't train to failure. So I think a lot of people when they train their forearms, they they they'll hold on to something until they can't anymore, they'll drop it. Every once in a while, that's fine, but but failure training, just like with the rest of the body, is less effective than going to almost failure. So I recommend 
if you're going to do a farmer walk, do it when you feel like, oh shit, I'm, you know, if I walk another five more steps, I'm going to drop this. That's when you stop. Don't wait until you drop the weight. The other thing you want to consider with uh, static training for the forearms is static training, although there's a, a general effect, most of the strength uh, is in the position that you're training uh, your forearms and hands. So what I mean by that is if you get really good at holding on to a barbell, that's the circumference that your hand and forearm get strongest at. Once you go wider or skinnier than that, you may actually lose strength. So what I recommend is do static training on different sized grips. So a couple of ways you do that is with either a bar, you could wrap towels around the bar to make it really thick so now your hand has to open up even more, train that static grip. You could do a pinch grip mm -hmm. where you're pinching your fingers together like you're holding uh, when you're holding a weight plate. You can also focus on each individual finger with different uh, types of plates. So those those are the ways I love doing static training. And I'll do just uh, like farmer's walks. Or those hang those fat grips are, I mean, a cheap purchase if you're somebody who's really chasing after forearm strength. And that's a, a tool that you can use to your point of using different. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're doing it to get better at your deadlift, which you'll be using a regular bar, it's probably best you get strong holding the bar really heavy and do most of your stuff that sure but the, but the carryover of training in different right, right, circumferences right. really is amazing going through that rice bucket uh, those drills in in OCR yeah. when we were filming that i was like wow man that was like substantial and i felt my forearms and in hands and grip and strength in general that that's was great. phenomenal for stamina and for mobility but let's say you want to build mass let's say you want to build mm. size in your forearms right you need weight trade them like any other body part uh, full range of motion. Your forearm muscles flex your hand, so that means they bring your hand down. Uh, they also extend where they bring your hand up. So those are the two main motions of the muscles of the forearm. But they also bend laterally. It's a shorter range of motion, but there are muscles that that flex your, your wrist towards your thumb and then towards your pinky. Do you do those wrist curls at all, like with the barbell? I used to. Yeah. yeah I would do. And my favorite one was a behind-the-back barbell wrist curl. This is where you hold the barbell behind your back, arms yeah. are straight. And then you, know, you let it roll down your fingers. You let it roll down a little bit, grip it, and then roll it all the way up. And then my favorite exercise for the top of the forearms is a reverse curl. This is where you grab. Uh, and, yeah. and if you want to really hit th uh, forearms, go thumbless. So you're gripping it with without your thumb. Like flippers, and you're, and you're yeah, and you're doing. I got really good to the point where I could curl as much reverse as I could with a. I used to love that grip. old school uh, uh, rope where you would like sort of roll up like weight uh, mm -hmm. from the ground. I used to do that all the time. Totally. Too. Now the cool thing about forearms is once you start to train them, they respond really well in most people, um, and I think this is because most people don't train them directly. But once you start to train them, they do a great job. If you don't train your forearms now. Do not jump into a full-on routine right out the gates because what will end up happening is you'll give yourself tennis elbow where you have pain at the top and bottom of your elbow from overtraining uh, the forearms. I suggest start out with once a week some forearm training. Spend about 5 to 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes on training your forearms. Once that gets easy, two days a week. Once that gets easy, three days a week. Three days a week, spending five, doing like a few sets uh, for your forearms. Is plenty. You know alongside what? You may you may have to make a forearm mod just because of how much we get this question. Oh, that'd be fun. And we we that's one of the that's one of the groups that we didn't do, huh, Doug? Yeah. yeah. And I didn't think about that. How much we get we get questions around this? Oh, it yeah. might be worth actually putting that together. There's awesome tools too for forearm training that you'll find in arm wrestling circles. Like there's uh, there's this one where it's a fat metal uh, like grip, and then it's got a chain, and you can attach weights to the bottom, and then the grip rolls. So you have to. It's basically oh, a static hold. I mm -hmm. think uh, yeah. Juji Mufu sells that. Doesn't he might. He? he might have that. I think he does. Yeah. So you stand up and hold it, and yeah. you have to grip it, and then the, mm -hmm. the roller makes it uh, more difficult. Um, the other, uh, uh, here's a great exercise. I love this one. Get yourself a uh, like a, a short barbell, um, and you can eventually attach weight to one end, so it's just one end, one ended barbell, or just use a, a metal bar, hold it at arm's length, and then do lateral uh, flexion of the forearm. So it's like at, out at one end or whatever. That one's also phenomenal. Next question is from Miss Brooklyn 11. Is there an optimal way to program trigger sessions? For example, should we do similar exercises and accessory movements to the big lifts we did during our heavy session the day before? I'm glad whoever picked this, I'm glad you picked it because I think probably one of the most popular things that I get uh, in my DMs is related to the trigger sessions. And I think maybe it's been a while since we've kind of gone over. Yeah. Uh, the philosophy uh, behind them. I mean, this is really Sal's baby when he created uh, MAPS Anabolic. Uh, he included 
uh, these trigger sessions, which um, I think are absolutely brilliant. Um, it was another one of the things that I remember when I was reading the program when he sent over that um, I really started to understand the the benefits of like active recovery uh, and frequency. And, and so programming it in like that is really smart. Now, I do think that a lot of people kind of misunderstand them and totally. and, yeah. and probably and the most common mistake I see with uh, our people that are following our programs is uh, too much intensity with mm-hmm. them and they're they're really not designed that way right they're designed more like just a frequency builder and in uh, active recovery I, I I try to explain totally. to people I came so I came up with the trigger session concept and the reason why I'm explaining why how I came up with it because it'll help you understand how to use them properly right I came up with this concept after observing the blue collar workers uh, of my family. So I, I come from a blue collar family. My dad uh, was a, a tile setter and a stone worker. Um, I had uncles that were in construction. I had uh, aunts and uncles who were mail carriers, plumbers, mechanics, and I noticed that. And remember, I've been I've been into training since I was fourteen. So I'd always notice from that age muscular body parts on people um, because it was something that I was into. And I noticed like that the mechanics and, and, and plumbers in my families had muscular forearms. Now, these were older men. By this point, they were, at this time, they were probably in their 50s and 60s. They didn't work out. They weren't fit. It wasn't like they worked out and they were into fitness. They ate terribly. But for the last 30 years, they were plumbers or they were mechanics. Um, then I noticed that the male carriers in my family – um, all had muscular calves. I even have. I had an uncle who had really high short calves, so that he didn't even have long muscle bellies. But this, he had this really bulbous short calf muscle. And I remembered, none of them worked out. And here I am in the gym, busting my ass, working out, lifting weights. Meanwhile, they have these, you know, muscular forearms or calves or or body parts related to their jobs. And when I would go to work with my dad over the summer, I would get sore for the first two weeks I'd go to work with them for the first two weeks mixing cement and carrying buckets of sand and you know carrying tools my hands would get sore my back would get sore my shoulders would get sore but after about two or three weeks the soreness would be gone and I'd kind of get used to it and then by that time summer was over and I'd go back to school so I'm thinking to myself like man my uncle's forearms are he looks like he's got bodybuilder form the rest of his body looks <laughs> doesn't look super <laughs> developed lots of butt cracking but on. he's got very muscular forearms and I'm thinking the, the 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 soreness and the muscle damage effects from working with wrenches, I'm sure he was over it by the, a year. Like a year into being a plumber, he's not breaking down muscle anymore. He's gotten used to it, but he just keeps doing it. And yet his forearms are, are super developed. So I started to think to myself, I wonder if muscle damage or causing damage, I wonder if that's really the only way to build muscle. It, it doesn't seem that way. I think that just sending a frequent signal without muscle damage also causes muscle growth. Now that's not to take anything away from the intense workouts because obviously that's real important. But what that told me was, I bet you I can add something to my intense workouts that isn't going to cause further damage, but that will also send another muscle building signal. Because the 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 big drawback with intense training, the big I, I would say the the roadblock or the bottleneck is at some point you can't add more hard workouts. At some mm-hmm. point your body just can't recover. If it could, you could just then great, I would just work out 24 hours a day and I'd get great results. But the reason why I can't is my body can't recover. So it's like, how do I add more but not damage my body more? Right. So then it came up with the concept of trigger sessions. Now, with a trigger session, it's not a workout. The idea is to get a little pump, maybe feel the muscle burn a little bit, and then leave it alone. And the goal is to do this frequently, several times a day, and do this on the days you're not doing your heavy, hard workouts. Yeah, which this point alone, I think a lot of people aren't doing correctly. Like, because it, it it does state that, you know, like three to four times a day would be like optimal. Like that's, you want to do these frequently because this is that signal you want to keep reiterating with your body and to get that blood flow because the blood flow helps to facilitate the recovery, then going back into your more intense workouts. And that's just the thing is it, movement is medicine. This is something that, you know, physical therapists always preach about, you know, anybody that's in the correct space, uh, you know, we need to be able to, to shuttle that blood flow to be able to make, you know, the body uh, to, to help it to repair and, and to replenish everything. Yep. Well, that's part of the recovery process, right? Mm-hmm. More oxygen, more blood, more nutrients. And if you are doing something that's going to pl- pump 
more blood, more oxygen, more nutrients to that area that has damage to it, it's going to recover faster. We know that. The right. science shows that. Without so, causing more damage. Right. But that's where there's yeah. the that's the caveat, right? right? If you actually do that too much to where you cause more damage, then you just get in that recovery trap all the time. So there's a sweet spot and it's and you're when you're doing trigger sessions, you're you're far better off uh, leaning on the uh, too or uh, too easy than to flirt with too hard. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you're just and it's kind of like how I also talk about mobility drills. Uh, you know, when we do mobility drills, it's not how intense and how hard and how long you can yeah. do that. You're far better off doing it more often and way less intense and just more frequently throughout the day. You'll get far better benefits. It's trigger sessions very similar in that matter. And that's why rubber bands were recommended because it, it yes. is one of those tools that, that, you know, provides less damaging type of an exercise. So you, you go through that natural strength curve and it, it sort of like uh, mimics that nicely. Resistance bands are perfect for trigger sessions because exactly that they don't cause a lot of damage also they are uh convenient because you're doing trigger sessions throughout the day you could take them with you to work and you know yesterday i hit my body really hard in the gym today is an, a quote unquote off day but today i do my trigger session so for five minutes in the morning i'm going to do two or three exercises get a good pump in the areas of my body that i think need a little extra focus so i'm gonna do a little biceps a little shoulders a little calves or whatever i'm not going to make it last longer than maybe five to eight minutes then again at lunch I'll do it again, and then again before bed, I'll do it a third time. And what it, this is what it feels like when you do trigger sessions properly. What it feels like is a turbo. It literally feels like it. it feels like your current workout has been turbocharged. Your current routine and your progress has been turbocharged. The key though is to be consistent, to do them frequently, to get a little bit of a pump, but not overdo it. And I can't stress this enough. If you do this consistently. It will blow your fucking mind. It really will. If you don't do it consistently, it's not going to do much for you. Yeah. So trigger sessions don't work if you do them every once in a while. They just don't. But if you do them three times a day on your off days, you know, you pick three to five exercises that take you maybe a grand total of eight minutes, shouldn't be longer than that, um, get a little bit of a pump, then you're done, do it again later in the day, then you're done, do it again the third time. Watch what happens. It's, oh, I, it, it, I will challenge that, though, that it, even just doing them once a day is a big deal. I mean, I noticed that when I first started to implement it into my routine and just, just being consistent with, hey, on my off days, instead of not lifting at all, I'm going to touch all the muscle groups that are kind of sore from my workout, but just pump some blood into mm -hmm. them and be done. 10 minutes, 12 minutes tops. You know, I'm not spending mm -hmm. very much time in it. I noticed a huge difference just from one. And then if you actually if you actually do discipline yourself to do two, three in a day, I think it's huge. But even just being consistent with on your off days, getting a light pump, you know, ideally I like bands or body weight. That's what I like. Yeah. And, I, and I know some you could do enough damage with body weight, but you know, I, I like I would do if I'm doing back stuff, I'm doing something where I'm doing like a a yeah, I'm using the, the Smith machine here to like do pull-ups on or something. Just sure, trying sure. to get some blood in my back. I'm doing chest stuff. I'm just doing push-ups with my body weight, get some blood in there, band stuff for like lateral raises. I mean, just that's all I'm trying to do. Shoot some blood in there for a few minutes and then I and then I move along. And even when I was just doing that one day, uh, one time a day, I saw a big difference. Dude, there was a be the best shape I ever got in my life is when I do that uh, consistently. So uh, and uh, it's, it's it can be. It can be hard to do, but it, it can also it's also easy once you get into the rhythm. It's easy if you if you schedule it. So like first thing in the morning, I'm my lunch break, and then maybe before I go to bed, or you know an hour or so before dinner, um, then it becomes uh, much more convenient. I'll tell you this too. Talk about energy. Yes, the energy that you feel from right doing after this, you do it feels amazing. Oh yeah, you, you're you're waking your body up, waking your brain up. I found myself to be far more productive. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of you who are listening right now. If you have a desk job. You know, in the middle of the day, doing a five to eight minute trigger mm -hmm. session, watch your productivity. You feel so much better. So yeah, to that point, I actually would use them. So I used them a lot with like corrective stuff with clients. So let's say I have a client who, you know, is at a desk all day long. And so our trigger sessions, they are they were less uh, aesthetic driven. Like, oh, I don't care about how much I look. I just want to feel better. Adam, I've got chronic mm -hmm. back pain. I've got issues from sitting at a desk all day long. So like band pull, pull apart. So I'd say, hey, you know, at every hour throughout the day, get up and I want you to do, you know, three sets of 20 band mm -hmm. pull-aparts to try and counter what you're doing by sitting at the desk all rounded. 
And man, that would feel, and they, that was what they would report back is not only did it feel better on their posture, but the energy spike they get, you know, when oh, you're totally. sitting still and you're not moving very much, heart rate starts to slow down, not as much blood pumping to the body, energy levels start to drop down a totally. bit. And just by you getting up, moving, moving around a little bit, pumping some blood, like all of a sudden you feel this surge of energy. That was one of the number one things that was reported from clients when I had them do that. Next question is from O. Borer. What are your top tips to help clients who have trouble with sugar and tend to binge and restrict? How do I help them find a balance between being able to have a little something once in a while without going crazy? Who picked this? You? Yeah, I picked this one. You picked this one? This yeah. is a, this is cool. I, I knew you had some good tips for, you know, like cravings of sugar and all that. But we've addressed back in the day, but I, I, I it, this is a common thing that just keeps popping up all the time. And, you know, like most clients that we see, it's it's pretty much related to sugar where most of their bad habits stem from. Well, this is also where, you know, uh, recently when we, we, we signed with uh, Magic Spoon, we got, uh, you know, our forum is always quick to be like, it's processed, you know, and it's like, okay, it, it, we will always on the show, this message will never change that, you know, whole foods are ideal, you know, eating tons of uh, processed sugar is not a good idea at all. But at the end of the day, like there's, uh, I, I enjoy uh, sweet and I like to do things that uh, like I can sit down and feel like I get that sweet uh, that sweet feeling from whatever meal I'm having, but then I don't feel like I abuse it and go over the top. And for this, I like products like that because it helps. This is something, it's funny that I know it's a cereal and probably most people would eat that for breakfast. I already have like a great routine for my breakfast. I love my, you know, bacon and eggs or steak and eggs. Like, and that's a, I love that for breakfast. So I don't need to fuck with that. So honestly, I never even use Magic Spoon for breakfast. What I use it for is, for a majority of my life, I and talked about on the show that I fucking eat ice. I used to eat ice cream every single night forever. Yeah. So I have this crazy sweet, and part of that's behavior. Part of that is that I my body's adapted to wanting that for so long. So I after dinner, I have this sweet tooth where I would want to eat ice cream, and this is where I use a tool like this, it, it, where I can go have a bowl of Magic Spoon, which you know I'm eating. Two and a half cups, which is like nothing, okay? Gives me 30-something grams of protein, extremely low on sugar. I have it with almond milk or macadamia <clears throat> milk, and it gives me that feeling of I get a little bit of a sweet mm. kind of taste or dessert feeling. I'm eating it out of a bowl like ice cream. And at the same time, too, I'm getting a, I'm kicking my protein intake. I, would per, I prefer to do things like that than just have a boring-ass protein shake. If I'm like needing to bump my protein intake, I also have a little bit of a sweet tooth. This is how I use tools like that. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go a little bit deeper uh, with this in the sense that, okay, so the, the question is, how do, I, how do I train them to find a balance between having a little of something and every once in a while without going crazy? She also used the term, or he used the term, binge. This is a symptom of something. This is not... This isn't the cause of the problem. This is a symptom of right. another issue. And, and, and I'm gonna, I don't know this person, so I'm going to take a guess here, but I think it's a good one, that they are in that restrict binge mentality where they, are, they feel like they can't have something. So if you were to offer them a cookie, no, I can't have that, would probably be what would come out of their mouth. That almost always results in the opposite when the person finally breaks free of their, you know, their own tyranny on themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they binge. A better approach, one that I found that works for me, is to help teach your clients the all the true values of food. So what are those? Um, food, it tastes good. That's a, that's a value. It's a real value. We can't deny that. We cannot deny that we value food because we enjoy the way it tastes and the way it makes us feel. So that's valid. We can't invalidate that because invalidating that and saying all food is is fuel. You'd be lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself, and that, that, can, that can contribute to that. But food also provides us with nutrients. It's also fun to eat certain things when you're in certain places, like eating a hot dog at a baseball game or popcorn in a movie or, or, or birthday cake at a birthday. So there's there's context, there's culture, there's uh, sometimes food helps us with our emotions. That's valid. is isn't always a great choice, but it's also very valid. Once you understand and accept all the real values of food, then you can make your decisions based off of that information. So now when I'm going into a, a situation and I'm presented with sugar or cookies or whatever, 
I can say to myself, okay, uh, definitely going to taste good. I'm going to enjoy it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm hanging out by myself at home. I don't really need that value. Um, I don't want it. I actually don't want it. I don't want it doesn't mean I'm not acknowledging that it tastes good. It means I don't want it because right now I don't, that's not the value that I want. But let's say I'm at a party with friends and we're enjoying ourselves and somebody made cookies and sure, physiologically, it's not good for me. It's not going to be great for my muscle mass or my fat or whatever. Uh, but hey, we're enjoying uh, each other's company. We're having a great time. Right now, I value the fact that this is going to taste good. So yes, I want that. And it's a totally different mind. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mind shift that you make. But when you're able to make that mind shift, what ends up happening as a result of that, the side effect of that is you don't binge. Yeah. You just have some when you want some and you don't when you don't because you understand the true value. There is no – because think of the behavior of binging. The binging behavior is has very little to do with enjoying the food that you're eating. Think about the last time you 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 had that kind of binging tendency with something. It wasn't about the food that was in your mouth that you were tasting. It was about getting the next piece in your mouth. Every piece you put in, you don't want. It doesn't matter what you taste. It's about getting the next one. So it's next, next, and it creates that impulsive type of behavior. It's not a, binging is not about enjoying the taste. Mm. It's not about enjoying the food. Binging is about revolting against your own tyranny of saying, right. I can't. I also think it's great that we live in a time where we've been able to engineer things like a magic spoon cereal, where I get some of those those pleasures of what it's like when sure. I... And, and at the same time, with it, it the actually, aftermath isn't quite as bad. Not even not quite as bad. I'm actually getting some benefits. I'm, yeah. 30 grams of protein is not easy to come by. Right. So getting the fact that I could sit down and I can have, or something like Halo ice cream, that, you know, the whole pint of that thing is, you know, they have ones as low as 220 calories. Mm -hmm. 220 calories for me is like nothing. If I ate a bowl of ice cream, which I, or Ben and Jerry's, which I used to do, that was 1,500 calories of a sugar bomb. Like, yeah. I'm asking for diabetes eating that every single night. It's the same thing. I mean, like, I get made fun of by my friends all the time for drinking White Claws, but it's, it, it <laughs> you know, it's like less calories. There's no gluten. Like, the, you are a the, basic bitch. There's like these things there, though, that you just start to evaluate. Like, I know exactly what I'm going to feel like, you know, immediately after I, I go in this direction or I go, you know, the next day, what that, that, that's going to look like. And, and, you know, it's, it's a maturity when you start to look at all these things where, okay, I know, I know if I keep going in that direction, it's going to, you know, take me completely off track, but there's a way that I can sort of be a little bit more reasonable with it. It's still incorporated yes. in my life because I still reap some of the benefits of just relaxing, just hanging out, being social, yeah, and, you and, know, whatever those reasons are. And here's the big difference. Do you feel restrict, like you're restricting yourself from beer and wine, or do you feel like no? Nah, I, I pursue that because it's I get that like calm, like you know, like nice social kind of takes the edge off a little bit feeling. But I'm not like I don't feel right. like that's it's, the difference. Yeah. It's, you're not saying I can't. Oh no, I'm, I can't have beer. I can only yeah, have white have claw. Because yeah. what'll end up happening is you'll have a couple white claws, loosen up, and be like, "Fuck it, I'm having hella beer." Well, it's the common <laughs> it's a combination of what both you're saying right now, and I, I agree with you, Sal. Like you have to first. Uh, those tools uh, are are band aids if you don't first address totally. where this came from. Definitely, and that's where I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of uh, taking a client who uh, abuses sugar like crazy, hasn't even figured out why they do it. Yeah, and then you're like, here, just have artificially sweetened. Exactly, everything here, just have magic spoon all day long, and they eat boxes of it for yeah. nighttime. They just binge something that's a little less bad. That right, definitely right. can that, happen. That that is still a poor relationship with the food. But if you first teach them to unpack what causes them to do this binge and restrict thing and you and they understand like for me like it took me a long time to really figure out like why do I do this with sugar foods and then I rem and then I remembered that when I was a kid it was very rare that uh, we got like treats like Oreo cookies or Fruity Pebble cereal or mint chip ice cream but boy when it came in a house of you know four kids it was like you better eat the shit. Out of it you had to eat the shit out of it. Yeah, you know. And I, I remember as a kid, I remember even sneaking out of bed and like coming back, and even after I was told I couldn't have another serving, going and get it because I knew that between the four kids, the two adults, one freaking thing of ice cream doesn't last more than a day or two. Dude. And so I would always over consume and binge in fear that I wouldn't get. It. And then you would know like that ice cream would come. And then as a, as a kid, I might not get to see it for another three months before it made its way back into our into our. <laughs> so you our, better eat it all, right? Yeah. And so I built that relationship from early ages all the way into. And then guess what happens when I became an eighteen year old adult who makes good money? 
what do I do? Fucking A, I'm going to load my freezer up and all those <laughs> Always things. Always have Ben and Jerry's it, on hand. Because I can. Yeah. And so then I then I, I went from it being a uh, you know a, a, an issue that I had as a child because it was uh, never around, and then I overcompensated as a, a young adult when I had the money and I could afford to have ice cream for breakfast if I wanted to, and like an asshole, I did things like that because I could. You know, or sit down watching television with a spoon in the big, in the big ass gallon of ice cream because you can. And so then I went to that extreme for so many years. And so once you once you realize what your story is and why you do those things, and that's just mine. Like you're, you're somebody else, it could be they're hiding from emotions, or they have it's a comfort food for them for other reasons. Once you start to realize, unpack all that. Then, uh, then you can start to use tools, I believe, like the halo and the magic spoons and the things like that. And then I see a lot of value in intermittently. I don't eat that stuff every single night, mm -hmm. but what I do, I, it's in my cupboard. It's a it's treat. In, it's in my freezer. Yeah. And when I'm like, hey, you know what? Great week of training this week. Oh, it's, I, we're getting, sitting down to watch a new movie we haven't seen yet. I oh, all of a sudden I get that feeling of God. I wish I had a bowl of ice cream. No, you know what I have? I have magic spoon in, in my yeah. cupboard. I go get that, and I get that feeling of satisfaction, like as if I was having that. And then at the same time too. Oh, what do you know? I get some benefits yeah. of protein. My, my dad that. used to buy uh, spumoni flavored ice cream. Do you guys know what spumoni is? No. Spumoni. Fucking yeah, gross is what it is. But what he, is that? It, it's 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 like different layered Italian ice cream. Thing? Yeah, and it's got like fruit and nuts in it. And it's oh, it's yeah, basically, right. you nice. know what a fruit cake looks like? Yeah. It's like that, but ice cream. And Ugh. he would buy that knowing. I've never even heard you mean of that. the gift that everybody just re gifts and it's, like throws away? It, but he knew <laughs> none, the kids cake. wouldn't eat it. So that's the only ice cream he would buy. And I opened the freezer, we're like, oh, you know? <laughs> But finally, what we did is we figured out if we scooped out, like if we scooped around the fruit and nuts, we get like the strawberry. So he'd go in there and be like a no whole thing, like a whole segment missing. <laughs> I can't be the only kid who did what I did. I know that there's more people out there that grew up in a big family that had to fight for the food. Of and then when you became yeah, an adult, you became an asshole just like me totally. and you filled your cupboards with that stuff because totally. you could and totally. then you overate. Next question is from Isaiah Mad. Is a plant-based diet superior to a meat-based diet? Oh, God. Yeah, you know, um, okay, so I'm going to speak uh, generally first, but then we're going to get down to the individual. I want to let out a sigh of like, ew. Yeah. <laughs> ew. And at the, uh. at the end of the day, I'm going to say this. At the end of the day, my general, what I'm about to say generally, doesn't make, doesn't make don't care about that. It all goes down to the individual. But let's start generally first. Generally speaking, when we look at the studies that we have on the healthiest people in the world, a diet that is comprised of a lot of plants with some meat seems to be healthiest, generally speaking. Okay, not vegan, not vegetarian. I'm saying a diet that is comprised of a lot of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and that also contains some meat. Which so, doesn't fall in either one of these categories. Well, that's, not, that's not a meat-based -based diet. Based diet. It's not a plant-based diet. No, it's, it's less a, than plant-based, although you could say it's plant-based, but it's less than plant-based because it includes uh, you know, more meat than just you know, once a week or whatever. Um, now, that's what the studies so ge show generally, but here's the problem. The problem is that you have a unique physiology, microbiome, you have a unique uh, life experiences and immune system that really give you a fingerprint. And that means that your body is relatively unique in terms of how you respond and react and feel, here's another big one, feel around certain foods. I think sometimes we separate the emotional connection to food thinking that it's not important. It's extremely important. If you eat something that you, uh, if, if there's a, there, there may be a food that provides you comfort that to me, I look at it, it provides me with nothing. So that may have a different value to you than to somebody else. You can, there are people out there that can eat a very high meat based diet and be far healthier than if they themselves ate a plant based diet. And the true is the, the, the reverse is also true. So at the end of the day, it all comes down to the individual. So I, I, I really despise these. These type these these general like oh, well no. my my disdain is really the superior statement you know because again to to get to take it back to the individual there's just so like there's everybody's so biodiverse like there's so many variables to consider what is going to be most appropriate to your genetic makeup and to what will benefit you the most nutritionally and so to have these statements like that really just it, it irritates me that because it's it's an agenda it's a marketing it's it's what's the the new you know tribal thing where like plant based it, it be, is 
I mean, it's just getting pushed so hard out there that it just it, it makes my skin crawl. I, I actually, Sal, I don't I don't like the analogy of uh, it's like a fingerprint or you either because it gives people this because first of all, it's not your fingerprint is your fingerprint for the rest of your life and it never changes, it stays the same. Uh, what is working for you today? could absolutely change tomorrow. Oh, so you're, it's you're, more you're, unique than that. Yes, yeah. your fingerprint is is not. It's forever and it's the same. And the reason why I don't like that analogy is because a lot of people, what ends up happening uh, is they, they follow a typical diet, whether it be plant-based, meat-based, or whatever that is, and they have phenomenal results, and then they, they marry that. And what, they, what they, they lacked to realize is that there's a good possibility – that it's less to do with the diet that you're now following and it's more to do with what you weren't doing before or what you were doing before that was causing harm. So you were either doing something that you were eating that was uh, uh, not advantageous for your body and now that you've eliminated that because this new diet doesn't allow that, you feel amazing, or there was something that you were lacking and you weren't getting, and now that you're on this new diet that is that is based mainly around that, you're getting all the nutrients from that, and so your body responds incredibly. And that's all it was. It wasn't that this diet is great or best for you even. It's just that you were missing something, you now have it, and honestly, that could fucking change. You could easily go through a period, whether no matter what based diet you're running, and over consume in a in a state where you're in an inflamed state and now you get leaky gut and something from that diet now leaks into your bloodstream you now have a an allergic reaction to it in the future and now it's all flipped on its head that's no longer working for you especially if you're following one of these diets that is very restricted and you have to eat a lot of the same food because that probably increases the chances of that having happening that was one of the things i actually didn't like about when we went on the uh ketogenic diet was, man, I found myself eating a core eight to 10 foods, which I also noticed with my friends that do things like vegan, like you find something, you find a handful of foods that fit into the parameters of diet. And then you eat like 90% of that. And then you know, every once in a while you move out. Yeah, of we're the, creatures of habit. Yeah. yeah. That's going to happen. You want to make things easier for you. Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't know, dude, it, there, there's benefits to going vegan. You know, the, we're not saying there isn't. Like, there's some people that could benefit from that, you know, nutritionally. And, and you know, again, it usually, like, revolves around deficiencies or not, you know, introducing these type of nutrients otherwise. But there's plenty of nutrients in red meat that you could benefit from as well. So you can't, like, make a blanket statement like that that it's superior. No, well, no there are some general rules. I mean, generally speaking, don't overeat. Uh, overeating on any diet is not going to be good for you. That's uh, the number one effect. Yeah, that's number one. Uh, number two, you need to have some proteins and fats. Those are essential. Uh, you can't have a no fat or no protein diet. You'll die. Uh, so those are hundred percent. You need them. Number three, heavily processed foods probably shouldn't be a big part uh, of your diet. They should play a small role, uh, in your diet. That's a good general rule, um, to kind of live by. Other than that, you want to eat based off of what makes you personally feel the best, but you have to be honest with yourself too, because sometimes you go in with an agenda and you ignore yeah. signs and symptoms. Like I would have people messaging me saying, hey, Sal, I've been on this ketogenic diet that everybody's talking about. I've been on it for three or four months. I feel miserable. I feel terrible. <laughs> when am I going to start to feel better? Yeah. I'm like, well, you're not. It's not How for much you. longer? <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah. for you. You need to go off of it. Or I've also worked with vegans who went vegan and they're like, you know, I feel terrible, but I know how bad meat is, so I'm just going to stay on this. What, what should I throw in? I'm like, well, you should probably throw in some meat. I think you're lacking some nutrients uh, that you can only get uh, from meat. So... Um, at the end of the day, it's it's very individual, and Adam's completely right. It does change your your circumstances change, your stress levels change, your the, the demands upon your body start to change. You may start to develop food intolerances as you get older that you didn't have uh, when you were younger, um, and it, you know variety helps quite a bit. Now, meat is extremely nutrient dense. It's actually one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. Uh, but not only eating meat, uh, will you have some nutrient deficiencies? You might, you might, you might start to play in that. But not eating meat, only eating plants. Will you have some nutrient deficiencies? Yeah, you increase your risk uh, for sure. Variety uh, kind of helps uh, offset that a little bit. So having a little bit of everything is kind of a good strategy. Very few people should be on the ends of the spectrum. I'll say that. I'll, I'll make that statement. Very few people should be all meat or mostly meat, and very few people should be just all plant. Um, you'll find most people are somewhere. In the middle, the extremes tend to be people who have reactions to, uh, you know, the the offending uh, foods or whatever. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com, 
and download all of our resources and guides. They're all totally free. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. 